Hello, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation to talk about Ida Pfeiffer, the first female tourist, as I hope to convince you she was. Pfeiffer was the most unlikely heroine you can imagine. This is the first known photograph we have of her. She was not beautiful or glamorous or rich or well-educated or well-connected. She seemed to have none of the attributes you might expect for someone to be uh, skyrocketed to world fame and to do things that no woman had ever done in the history of the world. And yet this plain, unassuming housewife from Vienna would uh, shake the world, literally. And after her, things would never be the same again, both for women as travelers, but also for tourism in general. Now, a tourist, exactly, well, what is that? Well, a tourist today is such a common word that no one would think twice about what a tourist is. But the word has not always existed. And, and it was at Pfeiffer's time that this word was first coming to be used. Before that, people used words like traveler or pilgrim. A tourist was simply someone, and, and still is, a tourist is someone who travels for pleasure. A tourist doesn't have any actual justification or reason to go somewhere. They just want to go and see it. They want to visit a place. They want to experience the peoples. They want to see the sights. Or nowadays, they want to take a selfie in front of a famous building and then move on. And this is very much what Pfeiffer was. She traveled not because she needed to go anywhere or, or had any particular interest in the places she visited. She just wanted to go and see new places and experience them for herself. And this is what she did. So this, I think, makes her very much a tourist, even before the name or the word was commonly used. Now, Pfeiffer was born in Vienna in 1796, the daughter of a wealthy merchant family. So she originally was born into a life of moderate uh, privilege. But she was a tomboy, very much so. She refused to wear girls' clothes. She wore boys' clothes. And she played with her brothers with swords and with toy soldiers and so on. But her father was very um, uh, permitting of this behavior and, and that was uh, all right. But after he died, that, well, that things would change. Now, Pfeiffer's first <laughs> step onto a larger stage came when she was only 12 years old. And when Napoleon and the French army came in marching victorious into Vienna, the capital of the country they had just conquered. Now they were coming in, it was basically like a parade. And the citizens of the city lined the streets to get a glimpse of the, the world famous uh, Napoleon. But young F uh, Pfeiffer, oh, sorry, well, we should call her now Ida Raya, that's her maiden name. So young Ida, was fiercely patriotic, and she regretted that if only she had been born a boy, she could have become a soldier and fought to protect her country. Hearing that the hated tyrant was approaching uh, around the corner on his horse, all she could do to show her hatred and defiance was to turn her back on him. Well, it turned out it wasn't Napoleon, it was just one of the generals, but her mother was so shocked that she boxed her ears ashamed and probably perhaps a little bit afraid of what might have happened uh, had this defiance been seen. Then the Emperor Napoleon did come around, but this time Ida's mother held her firmly by the shoulders and she wasn't able to turn around. So all she could do was fiercely close her eyes so as not to see this uh, hated tyrant. Well, Ida, uh, like most girls in those days was not sent to school because there weren't any schools for girls and her family hired a private tutor who taught her uh, history and geography and other things. Well, this by the way is not a painting of uh, her actual tutor Trimmel, this is just a young man from the time. But the young girl soon came to greatly admire uh, and eventually to have a basically a crush on and to worship Trimmel her tutor. And for his sake, she did what she had been told to do by her mother, and what she didn't want to do, which was to 
to learn the feminine arts. That included needlework, learning to play the piano, learning French, and doing her studies. And so she did what she had long refused to do, long resisted doing. But eventually, after, after Trimmel um, had finished his job there and had left their employ, but he remained a family friend, uh, the young Ida and Trimmel developed a uh, feeling for each other, which blossomed into love. And they hoped to marry. Well, when Ida's mother discovered uh, this plan, she was outraged. Trimmel was far too socially inferior, she thought, for her daughter. He was banished from the home, told never to return, and never to have any contact with Ida ever again. Ida was heartbroken. And like she had done before when it, they tried to force her to wear a dress and to give up boys' clothing, she fell into a type of fever or illness, uh, which was probably psychosomatic in some way, and it was feared that she might die. In fact, she overheard one of the nurses saying, the family thinks she's going to die. And I, Ida, hearing this, thought that perhaps this means that her defiance of throwing herself into apparent death was not going to help her get her way. So the next morning, she said she felt better and, and uh, got up. But alas, she could not avoid her mother's intentions for long. And suitor after suitor came until finally she could not resist her mother's wishes any longer. And so she agreed to marry a man named Dr. Pfeiffer, who was a lawyer from a neighboring city. So the two married, and at least from Ida's perspective, she would be far away from her controlling mother and the things in Vienna that had made her unhappy. But married life for her was equally unhappy. The marriage was not a love match. And although she had two sons, Dr. Pfeiffer's circumstances soon deteriorated. Uh, it's a long story, but he basically uh, lost his money, although he had been originally rather wealthy. So he lost his job and his money. And thus followed a long period in which uh, Ida Pfeiffer was impoverished, but too ashamed to tell her family about it and to ask for help, which she desperately needed. So she did various odd jobs, including giving piano lessons in order to earn enough money to feed her sons. She and Dr. Pfeiffer eventually separated amicably and she returned to Vienna. After her mother died, she received a small inheritance, which meant that she was no longer completely desperate as she had been before. But during all these years of unhappiness, there was one thing that she constantly thought about, which was, what would it be like to travel to faraway lands? That was the kind of romantic literature that she had learned to love while studying under Trimmel, her former tutor, to travel to faraway places. But at one point, she took one of her sons to Venice, and she made a trip back home to Vienna on her own. And here she realized she could travel by herself. Now in those days, of course, women did not travel alone. Perhaps a tiny journey within their own country was not a big deal, but to travel internationally alone was unprecedented. It, it was not done. And everyone in basically every country would have agreed that that was just an impossible thing that could not happen. That is what Pfeiffer was going to be up against. Well, ultimately, after her sons were gainfully employed, Pfeiffer decided, right, my motherly duties have been completed. I'm an independent woman now, I'm all by myself, and I want to travel. So she cooked up a plan to travel all the way to Jerusalem in the Holy Land by herself. Her friends and family probably would have tried to stop her. So what she did was she kept the plan a secret. She got a passport secretly, packed her bags and told everyone that she was just going to as far as Constantinople. And there was a commercial steamship line that went down the Danube. Uh, so this was very strange and unprecedented, but 
it was uh, still acceptable. So that's how she started her first journey, which is why I call my chapter, <clears throat> the chapter of my book, A Secret Journey. So she made her way all the way down uh, to Constantinople and ultimately to the city of Jerusalem, where she toured many of the holy sites like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and so on. Although she claimed later in her book that her travel was inspired by a religious zeal, it's clear from the way she mockingly refers to all of the uh, so-called holy sites there that they, it's clear that she was um, not convinced that they were actually genuine. She thought they were all a sham to make money from pilgrims, which they were. Now she met a few gentlemen who were also traveling in this part of the world. And they proposed to her that they would make a trip to the nearby ruins of Bursa. And they asked if she would like to accompany them. Of course, she would like to do that very much. There was just one catch. You'd have to be a good horseman, they said. Oh yes, no problem, Ida replied. Well, the problem was that she had never ridden a horse in her life. And this is very typical of her character, that she would let nothing get in the way of reaching an exotic destination that she had never seen. So she went with the gentleman to where the uh, rented horses were and let them ride ahead and got on the last horse and tried to learn how to ride a horse while the others were going on before her. She almost fell off many times, but eventually she got the hang of it. This is also, I think, typical of Pfeiffer, that she would always jump in at the deep end where she just simply could not possibly know what she was doing and she always seemed to come out on top. Another little misadventure that she had was when, uh, again, the same group of uh, pilgrims, these same gentlemen, traveled to the monastery of Mar Saba, uh, which has, uh, unbeknownst to them, a strict ancient policy of not admitting any women. So when the visitors knocked at the gates and they were opened, the gentlemen started to walk in, when she was seen, the gates were slammed shut in her face. She was later, uh, 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 one of the uh, members of the monastery later came out and took her to a nearby tower, which you can see illustrated on the slide here. These are two drawings by one of the people who was with her at the time. She was taken out to the tower to climb a ladder and basically locked inside what is called the woman's tower overnight, a bit like Rapunzel, she said. And in the end, she took it off with a laugh and didn't mind. She later traveled on uh, by herself to Cairo, where we see her feisty side, because when she uh, disembarked from the ship there and the mule drivers uh, clamored around uh, trying to uh, carry her bags and so on and trying to cheat her, she would not put up with it. And she got out her riding crop and although surrounded by a group of men who spoke a language she did not understand and all by herself, she threatened to give them a smack if they wouldn't back down. And also the captain of one of these ships took a tip from her, which was intended for the crew, but she suspected he wasn't going to give it to them. She thought he was going to keep it. So she quickly snatched back one of the coins. He was furious, paced back and forth, screaming and shouting at her. And Pfeiffer, in her typical way, simply folded her arms and refused to budge until she got her way. She did this again and again. Another bit of a little mishap on one of these uh, short sea voyages was on a sailing vessel where a Greek sailor observed her using her toothbrush, something he had never seen before. When she put it down, he walked over and picked it up and she thought he wants to have a look at it. Well, he did want to have a look at it, but he also gave it a go and tried it out on his own teeth. He then put it down, looked at her, and nodded as if to say, mm, very good. So I can only hope she had a spare. From Cairo, she wanted to travel across the desert to Suez. Now, this was something she had to get some help to find some uh, camel drivers to help her. And this is a depiction of her that was later used in one of her books. So there she is. Uh, looking very out of place in an exotic desert, writing in her diary. And so she traveled overnight with these men and then back again. Again, very much a tourist. She, went, she had a look and then she went straight back. 
This was uh, the route of her ret return journey through Italy back home to Vienna. And when there, her travel diary was published as a book, at first anonymously, and it became a bestseller. This brought in some money and so made it possible that she could go on another journey, which she very much wanted to do. And so she chose to go to Iceland. Iceland at the time was seen as the most exotic, the most romantic, the most natural landscape one could find anywhere, completely undisturbed by human beings. So not really true, but still, it is a very grand place. When she got there, she was, well, how shall I say, less than impressed with the inhabitants and their dwellings. Uh, th these are some uh, illustrations of the dwellings of people in uh, Iceland from exactly the time she was there. The houses were covered with turfs and the local people tended to make their fires burning fish guts. So Pfeiffer, who was a great stickler for uh, domestic arrangements and cleanliness, was not impressed. She found the Icelanders dirty, nosy, <laughs> and basically she, she thought they were just every terrible thing except for one thing. She said, there's one th thing uh, I cannot accuse them of, that is they do not steal. But otherwise they drove her crazy and she had a terrible time there because there were really no traveling possibilities. She did hire one uh, old Icelander who's depicted on the left there. Uh, she called him a drunken Viking who could barely lead her and her horse but she camped out near the great geyser, which is where we get our word geyser from, uh, for a while until she was lucky enough to see one of the great uh, eruptions of the geyser. She returned home via Scandinavia, visiting many other sites. And when she returned home, once again, she turned her travel diary into another best-selling book. And after this voyage, she had brought something else with her. She had collected natural history specimens and some of the lists of what she collected are on the bottom right of the slide there. She had collected uh, these things to sell to the museum in Vienna. So this brought in a little more money. And so of course she wanted to travel again, but this time on a grander scale. And ultimately she would travel all the way around the world. Uniquely, in all of her voyages, she set out in the beginning this time with someone else, with a man, in fact, that she had met, a friend of hers, on the, her first voyage, Count Berthold, pictured here on the left. The two of them traveled by budget sailing ship, as she always traveled in the cheapest possible way, uh, to Rio de Janeiro. Very long voyage, and when they got there, the customs arrangements would shock a modern traveler. We are uh, put out enough by having to have all of our things searched through and go through mass detectors and the security arrangements and so on. That's nothing to the way it was in those days. Uh, Pfeiffer and all the other passengers had all of their bags searched through and so on, and every letter had to be opened and read. Nothing secret could be brought into the country. So that's much stricter than things are today. So the two of them traveled together for a short time, including making an excursion into a local forest. Uh, they were particularly interested in botany and the flowers and so on. But here's something very unexpected happened. From out of nowhere, a man leapt out and attacked them with a large knife. Presumably he meant to rob them, but perhaps also to murder and rob them. And this is an artist's rendition of the scene uh, from many years later. Pfeiffer uh, 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 was armed with uh, her parasol, with which she tried to parry the attacker away, he grabbed it and it uh, broke at the handle. And I will show you something uh, astonishing, something she never mentions in any of her writings. Um, at the German historian Hildgund Jela, who's done the, the most careful research on Pfeiffer, discovered that Pfeiffer had kept and preserved the handle of that parasol, and here it is. So it still survives and originally had a little note by Pfeiffer on explaining what it was. But this dangerous fight uh, was almost the end of Pfeiffer's travels. Count von Berchtold was cut and, and uh, out of the action for a moment. Pfeiffer, now armed only with uh, the handle of her parasol, pulled out a pocket knife and uh, tried to stab at her attacker and cut his fingers 
He, however, landed a, a mighty gash on her left arm as she held it up to ward off a blow. And she received a terrible wound and carried the scar for the rest of her life. Fortunately, some riders came around the corner just at this time and uh, the robber ran away and they survived. Berthold's injury became a little bit infected, but Pfeiffer soon healed and made a journey deep into the rainforest in order to visit the Puri Indians. They were the one of the last known nomad, uh, nomadic tribes in the region and she wanted to see them, so she traveled deep, deep into the forest with a guide, eventually reaching a tribe. They were very friendly to her and she, uh, they taught her, they showed her how they uh, hunted birds and monkeys and so on, cooked their food for her. They danced in the night around the campfire and then she slept there with them in the forest all alone. And here we find out something else about Pfeiffer. The only times she ever really describes being afraid was of the dark. And this was the first particular instance. When the fires died down, although she'd had no fear being with all of these people, suddenly her imagination ran away with her and she could only think of what wild, dangerous creatures are in the forest around me that might get me. And again and again, uh, she would describe the experience of being alone in the dark as truly terrifying for her. Well, after South America, she carried on to uh, Hong Kong and uh, ultimately to uh, Canton. Well, this was after the Opium War and the appearance of a European woman in the streets was considered to be uh, a great affront and she was almost stoned to death uh, before she reached the home of a, a Western merchant whom she had a letter of introduction. She traveled uh, on a local Chinese junk when the Europeans told her, you can't do that, Europeans don't do that. Of course, she wouldn't listen. She wanted to travel by the cheapest means possible, and she wanted to see as many local things as possible, and she did. But at the same time, Pfeiffer didn't do any research about the places where she went. She never mentions reading any books uh, or other sources about the places she's going to visit. And in, in, in the case of China, we see this particularly clearly. When she told her readers, in, in the greatest naivete, in China, the people eat with two little sticks. She had never heard of chopsticks, but chopsticks have been known in Europe for centuries. If she had read the smallest pamphlet about China, she would have known about chopsticks. She hadn't a clue. And this is also typical of her way of traveling. And she was very much shooting from the hip and just going from place to place. After China, she took uh, a steamship, much against her will because they were expensive uh, and smelly with all the oil and so on. But anyway, she arrived in Singapore in 1847 and stayed with a German merchant family with whom she had had an introduction. She described all the things she saw in Singapore, including a Ch Chinese lantern festival depicted here from one of her books. And this family took her for a hunting expedition into the interior of Singapore, hoping to get a tiger or a wild boar, perhaps, which they didn't see. But along the way in their little boat journey, Pfeiffer describes a ferocious battle with a gigantic snake, uh, which seems very implausible considering the men were armed with guns and the snake wasn't. So the snake lost and ultimately uh, they skinned it and gave the body to some Chinese workers. Later in the day, coming past that village again, Pfeiffer could not hesitate but run into their house to surprise them, she said, she wanted to catch them in the act of eating the snake, not to look at them, but to ask to try a piece, <clears throat> which she did, and she pronounced it very good. She sailed on, again, getting free tickets to Calcutta. From there, she wanted to ultimately travel all the way across northern India, and from east to west. Along the way, she met some gentlemen who were going out on a tiger hunting party on elephants. And they asked her if she would like to come along. And that is what is depicted here. And she is the female figure you can see in the center there, armed with a knife, which they gave her. And she describes this also uh, rather melodramatically. 
but in any case, another great adventure. Ultimately, she traveled in local transport, often in bullet carts, all the way across from the, the, the route that you can see here, from Calcutta to Delhi to Bombay. From there, she got a free ticket all the way to Baghdad. Here, once again, she could not resist inspecting the houses of the local people, uh, but although she had uh, dressed herself up in what she thought was a local, in local clothing. Then she undertook one of her most extraordinary voyages, which was to travel, again, alone, although with, uh, from time to time she had a, a guide, not really a translator since he didn't speak her languages, but she had a guide with her. Uh, on the route you can see here, all the way across um, modern Iraq, Iran, Armenia to Georgia, and ultimately uh, through Russia to return home by Greece. So she traveled in a way, again, that the Europeans said was impossible. That is to travel in a local camel caravan alone as an unprotected woman. She would not uh, heed any advice and she did so. Well, she was almost uh, killed by a man who wanted the hat she was wearing and they had a few other close calls, but otherwise she was fine. Along the way, she stayed, uh, she, she arrived in the city of uh, Urmia where some American missionaries lived. But arriving there in the middle of the night, the servants went up to tell the missionary that there's a European woman outside. He couldn't believe that because not even a European man could show up here in the middle of nowhere, he said. But sure enough, there was a European lady outside. It was Ida Pfeiffer. She stayed for a couple of days with this, uh, this is American missionary family, and she told them her story. And they were so fascinated that eventually their account was published in an American newspaper. But their, what they say, their version of her story sounds again a bit outlandish because they claim that Pfeiffer described that, that attack in Brazil by the robber as one in which she had cut off three of his fingers, which if you've ever held a pocket knife, seems a bit hard to believe. In fact, I think you'd really need a cutting board and quite a bit of sawing to get fingers off with a pocket knife. So it, it seems she exaggerated that, that story. She certainly didn't tell it that way in her own book. When she had entered into Russia, with, with again, with the caravan of strangers, she it was walking near the, the road when suddenly a carriage came rattling by and screeched to a halt. A large Cossack jumped out, grabbed her, and stuffed her into the carriage and off they went again. And she was held down. She was thrown in a jail cell for the entire night, not allowed to sit down. And it was demanded, where are your papers? She was suspicious. What, was she a spy or something? And she told them, my papers are in my bag back at the caravan. Well, by morning those arrived and it was seen that actually her papers were in order and she was allowed to travel there. And uh, instead of receiving an apology, she was laughed at. Now this injustice, like many others she experienced during her voyages, she could only really take revenge, like many of us do today, when she got home and writing about it, not on Facebook or other social media, but in her book. And she did. So she returned to Vienna in October 1848, and she'd become the first woman ever to circle the globe alone, and had seen more of the earth than any woman who had ever lived. This is an extraordinary achievement. And of course, when she came to write her book about this voyage, she achieved international fame. I mean, she became so famous. From now on, her, her voyages and travels would be followed in newspapers all around the world. The fact that Madame Pfeiffer had shown up in San Francisco or wherever it was, would be reported in Australia, in New York, in London, in Berlin, everywhere. Extraordinary. But she was com completely unique and unprecedented to everyone's experience. So her contacts at the Royal Museum in Vienna applied for government funding for her next voyage on the basis that she had brought back archaeological, ethnographic, zoological, botanical, and mineralogical objects of great rarity, which she had again. So she had become by this time a very great and experienced collector for an amateur. 
So she was awarded uh, 1,500 guilders to facilitate her future travels for scientific purposes, which is very interesting. So not only was she a, a, a lady traveler without precedent, but she was also one who was contributing to science, which was almost without precedent. So she had, was uh, breaking new ground yet again. So for her fourth journey, she headed out to circle the globe again. This time she went through London, where, as you can see on the slide here, she was at the, she got a VIP free ticket from the Austrian ambassador to the grand opening of the great exhibition. And in this illustration from the time, you can see Queen Victoria cutting the ribbon. And Madame Pfeiffer is one of the ladies present at this great moment. And in the top right corner of the slide, you can see her Austrian passport for this voyage. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about her collecting again. After leaving the UK, she went to South Africa, not knowing where to go next, because it turned out traveling up into Africa was way too expensive for her. She just had very little means. But she found a ship uh, where her fame got her a free ticket, a free journey from South Africa to Singapore, which is an extraordinary uh, distance around the world to get for free. And there she set about again living with the German merchant family she had before, who provided for her a nice cottage somewhere in the interior of Singapore so that she could collect specimens all day to her heart's content. And she would look back at this as one of the happiest times of her life. And she was free to, to roam the forest and find beautiful things everywhere she went and collect them. So on the 30th of November, 1851, she sent back another case of specimens to Vienna, to the museum, for sale. So this included a, a black and white caterpillar, which she found in, the, in, in rotting leaves. There was some seaweeds that she could dry and pack, and she collected a new species of mole cricket in the forest. And for almost a century, hers was the only specimen ever found. And she also sent a number of fish that earned her a whopping 25 pounds from the British Museum. That was a, a huge amount of money. But she wrote to her contact at the, at the Vienna Museum complaining of her lack of funds. She said, oh, my dear Herr Collin, you cannot believe how difficult it is to send collections when funds are so extremely limited as with me. And then she hinted, could he help her out with getting a bit more money by selling her specimens or perhaps some more government funding? Well, no more government funding was forthcoming. From Singapore, Singapore she traveled to Sarawak in Borneo, where she stayed uh, with the uh, entourage of the, the so-called White Raja of Sarawak, Sir James Brooke, who himself was not present there. Some time later, the great English naturalist Alfred Russell Wallace would travel to the exact same place and stay with the exact same people, and eventually the famous traveler Madame Pfeiffer was discussed. And here we get a new piece of information about Pfeiffer, which is uh, these men told Wallace something which he wrote in a letter to his sister, and we have this. So we know what they said behind her back. They said she looks something like Mrs. Harris in Punch. Punch was a satirical London magazine, and Mrs. Harris is depicted here. She's wearing an old-fashioned bonnet, and she's a gossipy, slightly crazy busybody. I mean, it was a very rude thing to say, actually. She was, an, she was a crazy old maid. That's what they were saying. And so that was the, at least with the, that group of hosts who, had been ve who were very kind and helpful to her when she was there. And she said so in her book. But we get a different perspective when we realize what they were saying about her. Here is an image from one of her books showing her crossing a, a Dayak bridge in, in Sarawak where she insisted on traveling uh, outside uh, Sarawak, which was controlled by um, the English Brooks, into the territories, the free territories of the Dayaks. Now, the Dayaks were notorious in those days as headhunters. And so Europeans talked about them a lot. Pfeiffer had no fear. And she traveled from, from village to village, which consisted actually not of a collection of houses, but one enormous longhouse. And she traveled one to another, sleeping inside these longhouses, often 
with uh, freshly severed human heads of their enemies drying above the fire hanging from strings. This she found quite unpleasant. And of course, when the fires burned down and the light went out, again, she was rather afraid. But of the Dyke people, she had nothing but praise to say. They were the most friendly and the most helpful people. And they helped her with her collecting of butterflies and things. And she brought back many uh, ethnographic objects. Uh, this is one I uh, acquired when I was traveling uh, in Sarawak, made by the Dayak people. She took many of these things back to um, Vienna, some for sale, some she kept. Well, ultimately, she made a, the voyage you can see on the map there from Sarawak inland over the mountains and down the river system to the Dutch port of Pontianak. This had never been done by a European before. And the Dutch, who uh, found her arriving one day, were utterly astonished. They could not believe that any European was coming from the interior, from the river, let alone an, a woman was simply a local guide to row her boat. Uh, eventually, when this story got out, the, the Athenaeum magazine in London described it as one of the most extraordinary journeys made by a European in Borneo. Not bad uh, for a lady with no real credentials. Next, she wanted to travel in Sumatra, where she had heard tell of the famous headhunters, the Batak people. Uh, sorry, not headhunters. They were notorious as cannibals. Uh, so that's what uh, legend had. And again, she was told by the Europeans, you can't possibly go there. You can't possibly go there. No man could go into their territories. Again, nothing would stop her. She had a, a translator and off she went from village to village to village. And she was helped often by local chiefs who would accompany her to the next uh, village, the end of their territory and so on. And ultimately, uh, she collected there a lot of artifacts too. Uh, I've, I have one here when I traveled to see the Bata ter ter uh, territories. This is one of their traditional calendars and she collected one of these herself. But Ultimately, she got to uh, so deep into their territory, far deeper than any European had ever traveled before, hoping to reach a supposed lake further in the interior. Now we know that's Lake Toba, but she, she would never make it because eventually uh, the Batak people would no longer suffer her uh, penetrating further into their territories. She was surrounded by 80 half-naked men armed with spears, screaming and shouting at her, making gestures that seemed to suggest they were going to eat her. She said they did something like this. <laughs> well, what to do when you're uh, a middle-aged woman surrounded by 80 armed men in the middle of Sumatra all by yourself? She had a plan. She had memorized a sentence in their language. So she walked up to the nearest one of these chiefs, chiefs uh, clapped him on the shoulder and said, you don't want to eat me. I'm an old lady and my flesh is certainly very tough. Now, Suddenly, all the men burst out laughing. Maybe it was just her bad pronunciation or what she had to say, but the tension was dispelled and she was able to, uh, to leave, but not to carry on the way she wanted. She had to return by, by a different route. Nevertheless, she had achieved something that no one had ever achieved before. She also traveled uh, further east in the region to the island of Serum, where she made an extraordinary voyage all the way across the mountains and to the other side of the island again to see uh, a group of people who were thought to be headhunters and eventually yes she did see and meet many of them and had, had more adventures. In this map you can see her route throughout Southeast Asia and interestingly uh, when Alfred Russell Wallace later came here he traveled to all of these places uh, so they, they uh, he very much she very much uh, forged the path and they were both collectors although she was very much an amateur collector compared to Wallace, who was a, a, a highly trained professional. Next, she got a free ticket again from Batavia all the way to San Francisco, where she experienced very much the, the Wild West, which has been depicted in thousands of films, but in a way that is completely fictitious. She, Pfeiffer saw the real thing and was disgusted that rumor, what rumors said were true about the Americans, that they really did spit on the floor and use their sleeves instead of a handkerchief. But she did also visit a, a group of uh, American Indians 
who were the last group in the area that she was able to visit. Again, it's a little bit dangerous, but she would, would, would never be stopped. So this is ultimately showing the, the route of her travels throughout North and South America. In Ecuador, she fell off a boat in the, into the river and nearly drowned because she couldn't swim. And no one on the boat realized that this lady floundering around in the water couldn't swim, but eventually somebody pulled her back in. She also made a journey up into the Andes, into the, in the footsteps of her great hero, Alexander von Humboldt. And depicted in the top right of the slide is a, a, a silken a dust mask with lenses that she wore in the Andes. And she was lucky enough to see an eruption of the volcano um, um, that Humboldt had also seen, Cotopaxi. From there, she traveled via Panama to New Orleans uh, and there was horrified at the practice of slavery and of human beings being sold in the markets and so on. It's something she deeply opposed, as did most Europeans uh, at, at this time. She traveled up the Mississippi in the flat bottom steamboats that we often see. And here she experienced a great discomfort as the her fellow travelers on these steamships were extremely nosy and rather pushy with their religion, something that she found deeply offensive. Every time she asked for something to read, someone would push a religious pamphlet into her hands, or they would constantly ask her, what church do you go to? What's your religion? And so on. She found these questions totally inappropriate. Or they would snoop around to see her butterfly collection in her cabin. Or their children would be screaming and running around and making everyone miserable. And so here in my book, I couldn't help but think that uh, her sentiment would have been this, that hell is other tourists. And probably the lowest circle of hell are the children of other tourists. And this is a truth I think many of us have realized. When she returned home, she published her next book, her second world journey. She had become the first woman to circle the world twice alone. And here you can see she was depicted in her, her, her own custom made travel costume at the request of a Viennese fashion magazine. She wore a Balinese hat, she's carrying a butterfly net and she would pull up her skirts uh, she didn't wear men's clothing. She, re she refused to do, to do this. She always wanted to appear as a woman because she was convinced that she would get better treatment, special treatment, and be allowed to go places as a woman that she wouldn't be allowed to go to as a man. And uh, she was proven right. But just have a look at this travel costume and how extraordinary it is. These are the dresses that appeared on the opposing page of that fashion magazine. Pfeiffer's appearance must have been the most extraordinary thing that ever appeared in that fashion magazine. So for the people of her home, she was an extraordinary anomaly, a bit of a crank perhaps, but internationally she had achieved such fame and respect. Here is just a smattering of, of her collection that she brought back from this second world journey, ethnographic objects and very many natural history specimens. In Munich, she was photographed twice by a prominent photographer. This is one of them. So here we can really see uh, in, in excellent quality what Ida Pfeiffer looked like at this time. She dressed in the complete, exactly the normal contemporary clothing for a lady of her social rank uh, when she was not traveling the world, but that's exactly why she liked traveling. She was free of the social constraints of her home and of society. She felt absolute freedom. She would cut off her hair, she would wear her strange clothing and she could go wherever and do whatever she wanted. And she did. She wasn't held back by anyone, but she was made fun of. Here's a contemporary uh, cartoon making fun of Pfeiffer from a German newspaper. It's called A Learned Traveler. And the caption is, Ida, don't run. I'm not afraid of savages, an Indian, but I am. Meaning that she's, again, a bit of a ridiculous old maid or busybody kind of similar to what they said about her in Sarawak. I don't think she was too bothered. Her next voyage was a voyage too far. She decided to go to Madagascar, one of the wildest places in the world from the perspective of a European because it was difficult to get there. 
On her way, she went through the UK again, and the British Association for the Advancement of Science awarded 20 pounds uh, to Mrs. Ida Pfeiffer, the celebrated female traveler, to assist in her researches into the natural history of Madagascar, which was a generous gift indeed. And hearing the news of this, Prince Albert made an additional contribution. And this uh, is what appeared in the press. His Royal Highness Prince Albert and Madam Ida Pfeiffer. Wow, why were their names conjoined in a headline like this? But it was because he had um, given an additional 10 pounds uh, for the adventurous lady, as it was reported. Well, now in South Africa, she was approached by this man, Joseph Francois Lambert, who turns out to be the villain of this story. He represented himself as a businessman who had a unique permission to travel into Madagascar, and he alone could get her there. But it turned out that Lambert was a liar, a villain, and a rogue. His real intention was something else, but Ida Pfeiffer, he had quite fooled. He told her story after story about the evil queen of Madagascar. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. How she tortured to death Christians and any opponents to her own tribe. Pfeiffer was, was uh, of course, revolted and outraged at all of this, um, but they traveled to the capital. She was introduced to the queen it's very unusual to see a European female. And Pfeiffer delighted the court when she was uh, invited to play a player piano that had been given to the queen sometime earlier. It was horribly out of tune, and Pfeiffer hadn't played for 20 years, but nevertheless, she, she was able to play a, a few uh, tunes, and everyone was happy about that. But Lambert was, in fact, planning a coup. He was going to remove the queen and have her son, the prince, placed on the throne, and the prince had a deal with him that Lambert would get all the natural resources of Madagascar. And Ida Pfeiffer had been duped by Lambert. She was along for camouflage to make his trip there look innocent. But the coup was discovered before it took place. And for two weeks, Pfeiffer, Lambert, and some other Europeans were under house arrest and under imminent, the possibility of imminent death. They were terrified. But they were not executed. They were instead banished from the country. They were not allowed to return. But instead of being marched back the two days back to the port, to a, a ship to take them away, they were sent then for over a month through the marshlands, where it was almost certain that they would catch the Madagascar fever. And they did. From this, Pfeiffer suffered terribly. And she was unable to even <clears throat> leave the guards and the other men to change her clothes for many, many days. But she did make it back to Mauritius, and ultimately she made it back to Vienna. But sadly, the Madagascar fever, she could never shake off, and eventually she died from it. So in a way, Madagascar and that queen had killed her in the end. <clears throat> Nevertheless, Despite all the hardships she endured in Madagascar, she came back with an amazing collection and she discovered uh, all these species you see on the screen now. Her final book was published posthumously by one of her sons. Uh, this is the English translation and it included a biographical memoir by her son and also an autobiographical document that she had written some time before. And that's how we know things about her youth and her background. She was called by one reviewer many years later, the most remarkable woman of modern times, because she had done things no one could have imagined were possible. She had a great legacy. Uh, her death was reported all around the world. Of course, she was without doubt, one of the most famous women in the world when she died in 1858. Here you can see that a couple of streets have been named after her. She eventually had a very uh, noble monument, monumental grave made for her in Vienna. And here you can see a map that I've uh, borrowed from a book by Habinger, um, her travels all around the world. And she would have many followers because she had paved the way and shown what was possible for a woman to do. And later after her, throughout the rest of the 19th century and then on into the early 20th century, 
Many other women took the bold step of going out and traveling on their own to see far off lands and to do extraordinary things. But what we, I think, should remember is though most of these other figures um, were better known today than Pfeiffer is. And yet the fact that she had gone when it was unprecedented, that she had gone without money, which many of these others had, makes her achievements far, I think, far more memorable, far more extraordinary than theirs. She left us some travel advice, which was my rule in traveling is to exclude every kind of superfluity. In other words, travel light. I quite agree. And if your travel plans don't work out, she said, I always succeeded in carrying out my own will. I found that energy and boldness have a weight with all people. Quite so. But many of us will be asking ourselves, was Pfeiffer a feminist or a sort of proto-feminist? And the answer to this is very interesting because it's no, absolutely not. And she was often asked this in interviews and often expressed her views in her own writings. She believed very strongly in traditional roles for women, that a woman's responsibility was to be a wife and mother and housekeeper. She had nothing against women being uh, professionals but she thought it was not possible for one to do both well. So she thought a woman should either have a career or she should be a wife and mother. Now you might ask, well, why was it okay for her to travel all around the world wherever she wanted? And she thought she was being entirely consistent. She said, I fulfilled my social responsibilities. I was a wife and mother, and I continued at that until my sons were financially independent. And once they were, my responsibility was done. And only then did I go off and travel by myself. So it sounds a bit like having your cake and eating it too. But I think it's very interesting and not what you would expect. I think what you would expect for people to talk about today would be that, oh, here's someone who thinks like a modern person who believes that women can do whatever men do. That is not the case with Ida Pfeiffer. She is a, a generation before that when it was really something that people thought like that women can do what they want. She didn't think they can or should do what they want. And I think that makes her more interesting as a, as a social and historical figure. Not that she should be praised for being like a modern person and thinking like a modern person, but reminds us that people in the past were not like us and they didn't have the same values as us and we shouldn't be less interested in them because of that. And so I uh, have concluded this story of Ida Pfeiffer. I hope you enjoyed it and thank you very much.